Welcome, friends. Good morning, good afternoon, however this video finds you. I hope you're doing well, and I hope you're having a good hobby experience up to this point. I want to thank everybody um, for the engagement on the last episode. It was terrific. Um, the comment section was just I mean, I was completely blown away. I appreciate each and every one of you and the feedback, um, even some of the criticism. It's great to get. You know, you never know uh, whether you're doing things right or wrong. Um, if things aren't landing right, I appreciate all that. I thought it was uh, it was a really, really impactful and important uh, opportunity for me to uh, learn more about what you're all thinking. And it, the video achieved exactly what I was hoping it would achieve is just discussion and engagement and discussion in the comment section on whether or not sports cards can be seen as investments. Um, maybe I was being a little coy about how I felt about it. I wasn't trying to just not have an opinion on it. I was really hoping to get your feedback on it, and which I did, which was wonderful. Um, I to totally lean towards, uh, I don't think they are investments um, uh, overall. I do think there are certain cards that can be, um, but I think overall, most of the cards um, um, are just not really investments in my opinion. Now, there are some outliers. I think uh, first Bowman Chrome prospecting is kind of fun. I mean, there's obviously arbitrage opportunities there. Um, if you get and buy into some somebody that's you know really cheap, or you pull, you know, you rip a pack of Bowman Chrome and you, you're able to pull like a gold refractor auto of a, of a a decent player, but you spent what three hundred dollars on that on that box to rip, and you pull out a card that's worth like five thousand dollars, even before the hype dies down, or maybe it becomes a star, and you grade it. Um, there's obviously an opportunity there to make some money. Um, so with all that being said, and I, I think the same can apply for, for football and basketball and hockey. Um, it just depends on whether you're lucky now buying something at a high price point and then trying to sell it later. Um, it, it's difficult in my opinion, unless you really know what you're doing. So with that being said, I feel like, um, how you hobby is how you want to hobby. You do it the way you want to do it. And I know there's a lot of folks that talk about that, but this episode, I, I wanted to talk more about, you know, who are we listening to? Um, I don't know if I consider myself an influencer. I feel like I just talk on on YouTube, and I don't try to influence people to do anything. I, I want to I encourage thought and discussion with these videos. Um, you know, it's taken a long time for me to even step into a role where I would do my own video, not because I was scared or, or it didn't or I felt uh, worried about you know what I would talk about or or say. Or any of the backlash that would come along with it but just i wanted to make sure you know i understood you know the space really well and had something that i could say that could be could add meaning it could be meaningful to the hobby um wouldn't just take away and just be some you know thoughtless you know blabbering that uh, people you know wouldn't benefit from um so the discussion aspect of it asking questions getting your feedback to me is really important because i feel like i learn i learn from you all out there because I'm, you know, fairly new in the hobby myself. I've only been, you know, back in it for about five, five years now. And I feel like there's folks out there that have been doing this for a very long time. And I, I definitely feel like I can learn from those people. So um, I'm always open to learning new things and, and understanding new things. We have to continue to evolve and grow. With that being said, I think it's important to pick and choose who you listen to. I think there's a lot of folks out there that are you know, looking out for, for the you know, nefarious activity that is, that is happening in the hobby. I think some of that can be great to pay attention to. Um, it, it, but if, if that's all you listen to, then you're going to get this negative um, aspect of the hobby. You're, you're going to feel like, you know, everybody's fraudulent. Um, there's always some nefarious activity going on and, and people's trust is being violated constantly. Um, you, we see all these different events that, that happen, the show bidding issues, um, whether it be, you know, real fraud and, and, you, a complete letdown of, of the, the hobby trust, maybe in, in an instance like card porn, um, you and the name itself just is always been weird to me. So I'm, there's nothing about that that makes me sad to see them go. But um, I think that it's about finding an equal foot, uh, getting the content you want and to, you want to listen to and finding an even, you know, I think with anything in, in any kind of content you you know, absorb, you want to find a good mix, a good balance. I think there are a few people out there that are just really positive and they, they want to talk about all the positive things that are going on in the hobby. That's good to listen to. I think there are folks out there that are just solely focused on, on the bad actors, not a bad thing to pay attention to because it's good to know what's going on. Um, and then there's some folks that are just really, really into collecting and they, they just want to talk about the different nuances of collecting cards. 
great to listen to as well. And you got the people that just love to invest and in flip cards or strategies that you can put into play. Nothing wrong with that. Great, in, great information. I feel like it's good to get a good balance of it. Um, what I don't like and what I feel like is, is important to talk about is, is the piling on of people. I feel like in our society, it, I think we're all guilty of this. We love to tear down someone that's been built up. And I, I could use examples. I don't want to use examples because I don't want this show or the Sports Card Dad channel to be about other people and, and posting comments about other content creators or other people in the hobby. Um, I think it's important to, you know, I want to walk that line and be respectful. Um, but what I will say is, like, I think, you know, I think in general, I, we love to see people built up the rags to riches story. But then, you know, when they're, you know, on the mountaintop for just a little bit too long, maybe they start feeling themselves a little bit, become, you know, overconfident. We love to see them make a mistake and fall from grace. It's almost like we celebrate it and we pile on. And, and, and even when we all have our own flaws, um, every one of us has them. Um, it, it becomes easy to do that. There's this fine line between being frustrated and wanting justice done and wanting more than what's deserved and not knowing how to shut that off that concern that frustration and that anger and and having it be in an appropriate place i think then it crosses into another side of it where then you're feeling sad and sorry for that particular person so now they become almost a victim and they and they you move into this other stage and I think the best approach to this is take everything is with a grain of salt. I think that when bad things happen, it's it's unfortunate. There are definitely victims to the nefarious activity and behavior that need to be you know considered, and it's important to you know it, that's an important part of the process. But I think you know there's always an opportunity to redeem oneself, and I think that's important. So choosing who you listen to, choosing how you respond, what you say is important as well. I think. Another thing that folks need to consider is the things you put down, the things you write down in a comment, um, the things you say to another person, whether you know them or not, um, whether you feel like it's deserved or not, th that's, that's, that's serious stuff. I think everybody, there's a lot of people out there right now that are struggling. You know, I think from a mental health perspective, they're having a really tough time. And, you know, being just completely mean and, and angry and vicious um, and what you say and how you say it to another person, it has ramifications. You don't know how it can affect another person. Um, so I think it's important for us to be mindful of that. Is there a way we can get our point across without being, you know, just downright angry and mean? Um, and is there a way we can put something positive back out there? Um, is there a way to position our, our, our frustration or our criticism in a way that, you know, helps people, you know, maybe understand there's an opportunity for growth, but without wishing ill will on another, right? And I think our, if you look at a comment, and this is, this is not just hobby guys. This is, you know, if, if anybody spends any time on Twitter or X, whatever it's called now, or Instagram or Facebook, anywhere, there's a lot of people fighting and, and casting out all these different comments and things like that. So I get, I think it's important for us to absorb, you know, think about what, what we're absorbing. You know, the, the stuff we're watching, the things we're paying attention to, what we stop when we're scrolling. Think about what you stop at when you scroll. What stops you from scrolling past something else? It's the weirdest thing these days because we'll scroll, scroll, scroll. And if you're like me, a lot of us have a lot of hobby content on our feed. We get a lot of reels and it's fun. It's exciting. I love listening to Adam from PWCC or his, his PWCC takes or really for any, you know, alt, any of those things that he talks about. Telling the stories behind the cards and the sets. You know, I know he's promoting auctions and all that, but I still learn things from him. It's really cool. It's a lot of fun. Um, the Find Your Trove guy, he, he's always putting out stories and random things, and it's fun to, to learn about those things. Graded card investor, going through the different cards, talking. There's, I, I'm throwing out a few names here of people that try to educate the hobby um, with these great stories, and there's a lot of folks that do that. Um, there's a lot of people that... Uh, you know, have takes on with who they think are, are going to be great players in, in, in any of the leagues. Those are fun to listen to. So you, you're scrolling, you're scrolling, you're scrolling. What do you stop when you scroll? What stops and captures your imagination and attention? 
Like what grabs you? Because it's interesting. I think from an algorithm standpoint, whatever you stop at and click on or spend some time with, it's almost like Facebook and Instagram knows that, right? And then so they just try to target you with more of that information um, and feed you more of it. But where do you stop? And with that being said, if you stop at stuff that's negative all the time, we're going to keep getting fed negative information. If that's what you always lean towards or seek out, well, that's what you're going to be thinking about all the time. That's what you're going to, that's what your hobby experience is going to be like. It's going to be negative. Is it going to be positive? Now, if you stop and, and re, okay, this is a terrible, this is a, you know, unfortunate event. I need to learn about it so I can better prepare myself. Um, that's good to know. Okay, well, there's this great story about, you know, 1999 game jersey set cards. I didn't know that about that set. That's really cool. I didn't know that about the players and, and the decisions that were made to make it and how important it is to the hobby. Um, that's really cool. That's fun. Uh, there's a great, you know, maybe there's a there's a site that, that teaches you about, you know, how to, you know, hedge your bets on a, on a player that you're trying to invest in maybe, or I don't want to say invest in, I just said you can't really invest in cards, but a player that you're prospecting with, I guess. Let's use that word so I don't seem like I'm talking in circles here. Just someone you're trying to have some fun with. You know, those sites are kind of fun too. You know, the breakdown of odds. Maybe it's a site that talks about the pack odds on 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 a new, a new release that comes out. You know, Scotty B Cards is a really good channel for that. He, he details out all the, all the pack odds and all that. It's like, really incredible math but it's still fun and cool to listen to i like kind of listening sprinkling a little bit of that into my experience i just think that there's a way to do it where, where we get a good even dose and if we focus on one too many too one person too much or one you know think about who you're listening to who are you paying attention to um it, i think would be important i know this topic's been brought up before i think all of us have i don't really think any of us really have an unoriginal idea or our original idea um, when it comes to talking about sports cards, because we talk about sports cards on YouTube or we have a podcast where we talk about sports cards. And, you know, some of us have different opinions on different things, but it's not like we're reinventing, you know, uh, you, we're not creating electricity here. You know, we're not, it's not a major invention. But I'm going to segue from that, though. I wanted to talk about that because it was just on my mind, on my heart. Uh, I don't know how, how often I want to release these videos, but I just kind of felt called to do it today. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about was I saw, I was listening to a, a, a episode of the crossover speaking of unoriginal ideas. Um, cause I, I, I listen to those guys and I get all these great ideas to talk about, but they're really the ones that are coming up with the ideas and talking about it, but that's okay. We can borrow from each other. Nothing wrong with that. But Josh and, and Chris had a, a really in light, a really engaging conversation about show bidding and I'll just set the record straight right here. I mean, obviously you, you don't bid on your own cards, right? Um, you just don't do it. It's not something you do. I don't think there's really an excuse for it really in any shape, way or form. Um, just don't do it. But with that being said, they talked about defensive bidding against a card. And that was an interesting conversation. Um, and Chris launched into a lot of different, uh, points on what defensive bidding is. Is it good for the hobby? Is it bad for the hobby? Is there a victim in all that? And yeah, there can be. I mean, I, and it made me think about okay, if someone wants to buy buy two of one card, and this probably gonna and this might happen. I feel like there's two reasons why this might happen. Maybe people just want to have duplicate copies. They want to own the market on a really low pop card. There's that. But for the most part, I think it's either you you're trying to you know take advantage of a deal on a card that you already have. Um, unfortunately, you're going to set the comp lower for that card if you're caring about the value. But if you're able to snag it and get it for a lower price, then you have some ammunition to maybe buy a Braille card that you're trying to consolidate into if that's what you're doing. I think that could be a scenario where it makes sense to try to get a second copy of a card. Um, maybe there's three now that I'm thinking about it. I guess this, the other second one I'm just thinking of now is maybe there's a better version of that card that you want to pick up a second copy of. And then sell the copy you have now because you feel like you found a superior copy to the one you already had. That's fair. That makes sense. The third thing is, I think if you're prospecting on a, a player, I use I'll use Bowman Chrome because I'm a, a Bowman Chrome guy. But this is pretend. Any you can apply this across the board, I guess, to Prism and, and, and Optic or whatever it is, whatever brand of card and player and league you're, you're, you're prospecting on, but you buy multiple copies of that card because you want to sell a couple of them, or maybe you want to sell one and keep the other, sell one to pay for the other one you have and keep the other one and hold it more long-term because you're bullish on a player. Or maybe it's, you know, I can see how that could possibly happen. And, and you're going to buy a second version of that card. So are you truly defensive bidding in those situations? I don't think so, but 
do you really want that card? Do you really want to reset the comp? Are you getting on there just to make sure the card sells for more than what you paid for? I believe that's that's nefarious in my opinion. I don't know if I get behind that logic and that sentiment. But here's the big issue. How in the world do we know what everybody's doing? I mean, it's hard enough to figure out what we want to do. Consolidate, re reaccumulate, and we change our minds as hobbyists and collectors, investors, whatever you are. We change our minds on that. I mean, I feel like all the time. I, mean, I know I do. I change my mind all the time. I mean, I have a few cards that I, I know I'd never really want to let go of that I've accumulated or that I've, I've been able to obtain. But, you know, some cards are kind of fair game. You're going to sell this one. You, you know, you change your mind. Like, yeah, I don't really want to sell it after all. And then maybe a two or month, two or three months later, you know, life event happens and you have to sell it. Or you find a card that you want more. And so you have to sell it to, to raise capital to buy the card you want that you desire more than the card you had. It happens a lot, I think, as collectors. I mean, I mean, again, tell me in the comments, based on everything we're talking about, is that something that you do? Um, or do you just buy cards and you keep them? I think most folks need to sell cards to buy cards. I've talked about that before in another show. But is that bad? I don't think it's bad. Does that not make you a collector? I don't think so. I think it's just all part of the hobby experience. But you tell me, if you think that's part of the, that's does that make you less of a collector if you have to move a card to buy another one? I feel like most most of the comments are going to support the fact that, you know what, it's your card, you buy, you do whatever you want with it. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is, is like we never, we're never going to really know, understand the true will of, of the buyer, anybody buying at an auction. It makes me wonder about auctions in general. I mean, how true are these numbers really? Um, again, I, I want to, I'd love to give credit where credit's due. I think Josh and, and, and Chris had a terrific that was a terrific topic. It was a question from their audience. Fair to that, fair to them as well. But they expanded on it in a really interesting way, and it just had me thinking, like, okay, so how many of these comps that we have are true comps for a card, and how much of it is is un in illegitimate um, price points for a card that we may want or desire, and then how much are we really truly wanting to spend on that card, and what's the true price of it? If there are people basically buying these cards just the price protect it or just on, on a whim deciding they just want to have a second version of it um getting the better copy so when you're talking about beckett um you're thinking you know potentially i don't know you got subgrades right so you have to think about the subgrades on a beckett card that that can dictate sometimes what whether you want to buy a better copy or better version. I mean, if you had a really good eye and, and you have a PSA or SGC card, you can tell it's a better version of the card than you're buying it. But what's the that nuance isn't really captured all the time. So comps are an interesting conversation, but the option and, and the true intent of the person buying the card is really difficult to detect. I think it's it's always going to be difficult to detect when someone's driving up a price of a card you want. I mean, if I'm selling the card, I want the card to sell for as much as possible. So there's a part of you as a seller, when you can sign the card out, gosh, you hope it, it sells for a lot. And gosh, you almost want to just look the other way and go, I don't really care what happens. I just want to, I want the card to go for as much as possible. If you're buying the card on the other end, you don't want to have to overpay for that card. And it would probably irritate you to no end knowing someone's on the other side, just trying to price protect that card and driving up the value in the auction so that you have to pay more for a card this person doesn't even really want which then affects you in a very negative way you're in your way you're you're victimized in that way in my opinion i don't think that's right but how in the world are we ever going to know tell me in the comment section if you had an idea how would we do that how could we possibly take away the anonymity of ugh, anonymity i can't even say the word the anonymousness of us of a buyer I mean, is there a way we can do this where it's legitimate? Um, where there's skin, where where you have to be, you're it's you're out there. You, you, people can see who's buying these cars on auction, and who's you know trying to purchase the card via auction. I know there's the feedback. You can go look some people up that way. You know, if there's zero feedback, there's there's different little you know tricks to the trade to kind of notice whether there's a show going on. I know folks are thinking about it more, but I mean, I just I just feel like there's still a lot of opportunity for you know nefarious activity to take place in an auction um what do you think we should do and if you're going into an auction and you you're targeting a card that you really want how can you defend yourself against that is it even possible 
I feel like if we want this hobby space to be taken to another level, if we want this hobby experience to, 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 to grow, to get better, I think we need to find a way to fix that issue. I think that show bidding and the potential for someone driving up a car, whether it's defensive bidding or it's people bidding on their own card via a consignment, is really, really, a, that's a drawback to me. Because if I'm going to go explain that to somebody who wants to get into the hobby space, they're going to they're gonna be, well, how in the world? Because that's the first thing they're going to want to know. How do I defend myself against that kind of stuff? And I don't know what I tell them. I don't know what I say to them. Because couldn't happen with, couldn't, could it still happen with golden auctions, PWCC? I mean, is it, is it, I mean, obviously there's, they're more careful about vetting people to come. I mean, there's that, but it could always happen one time for one person, right? Until you get caught and then you can't, you, then you're booted from a platform, but it could still victimize one person for one card. How do you, is there a certain way, is there any sort of certainty we can add to this? I don't know if there is. And I feel like that's an issue. Oh, well, Dennis, don't don't buy at auction. Make sure you work out a best offer or a buy it now or you know private deals where you know who the person is and you know what you're paying for. Yeah, you know you can steer people towards the private deal. You can steer, but then there's there's other issues with that, right? Then you're then you're 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 trusting the other end. You got to vouch and you got to get vouches. I just wonder, is there a way we can make this this hobby experience safer? on auctions it just it, it, it tickled my 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 you know intellect i i just didn't i just couldn't figure out a way okay if i want to buy a card and i want to buy it in an auction how in the world can i protect myself against this to not overpay for a card that should only be this much but is only this much more now because one person decided they wanted to do that and they had no intention of buying the card and how in the world will we ever know what people's intentions are? Because we keep changing our minds anyway all the time as hobbyists, right? Interesting topic. I wanted to release a small little bit. I mean, this isn't going to be that long. Uh, I first wanted to make sure you guys all understood, knew that I respect, I respect and appreciate all of the feedback. Um, it is really awesome to kind of comb through all those comments. But I also want to ask you another question. I want I want to ask you these questions I've had, you know, in this, this next video here. You know, can we provide a safer experience for our auctions to where any of this sort of bidding activity isn't taking place? Is it possible? Anyway, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Hobby experience. Let me know what you think below. Comment, like, subscribe. Follow Dustin and all his great stuff he's got on this channel. I look forward to coming back. Uh, maybe I'll do another episode. Um, we'll give you two this week. Um, but uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, give it a like. Tell me if you don't like this. If you think I'm, I, I don't know what I'm talking about and this doesn't make any sense, that's fine too. Throw it all in there. I'd love to hear what you guys are thinking. Anyway, have a great rest of your day, and we'll talk to you soon.